and with mourning, with broken and contrite hearts. For the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. God, you are the fountain of forgiveness and the wellspring of life. As we worship you, we are confident that we can bring our confession to you. You know us as no other. You love us as no other. We admit the sin of our human condition and our need for you to forgive us. Shower us with of forgiveness. Flood us with mercy. Forgive our sin. God has showered us with the grace of life in Jesus Christ. His saving actions on our behalf change everything. We are no longer held captive by sin and shame. We are forgiven and free. Praise, Praise God. God. Amen. And we sing, Gather Us in, hymn 532, verses 1, 3, and 4. Follow along with me, if you will, as I read Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. 
It can be found on page 64 in the Old Testament of the Bibles in the Pews. After receiving manna from heaven, the Israelites complain to Moses that they have no water. God directs Moses to strike the rock at Horeb with the same staff that struck the waters of the Nile, and when he does, water flows forth. A reading from Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. They called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please uh, read responsibly with me the psalm printed in the bulletin, Psalm 95, 1 through 11. I'll read the words in italics. You'll read those in bold print. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, on the day of Massa. When your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are people whose hearts go astray, and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest. Great term. Word of Lord, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> Give me a drink. 
you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, What do you want? Or, Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you, and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace I bring to you from God, our Heavenly Creator, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have to say, and also to those in the Upside Down, that this is very surreal. Uh, it reminds me very much of my preaching experience. Uh, I took an intensive preaching course this January, and there were about as many of these students in a sanctuary about this size, but full of marble and so lots of echoes. So I will require, perhaps, that you laugh a little louder when I say something funny. And if you don't laugh at all, then I'll, I'll be okay. Uh, I do want to say to those joining us on Facebook, uh, I normally don't keep my phone in my pocket uh, for because I don't like to be distracted. Uh, but I left it in my pocket this morning because every time you react, I'll get a vibration and then I'll know that not only are we together in spirit, but also uh, connected through this technology that we're able to take advantage of this morning. While this morning's gospel doesn't have Nicodemus in it, I cannot help but see the parallels from last week's gospel to now. I think that as I look back and have pondered my experiences of sermons over the years, that we do a less than adequate job about tying all of this church history together. We often view these events as singular stories, and not the rich tapestry of history that they represent for us. These historical moments, they take us all the way back to Adam and Eve. These stories are representative of who we are and when we are. 
Nicodemus' part in this history was wonderful. He represented us, he represented our curiosity, our wrestling with Christ's words, our moving about in secret, specifically in today's society, in fear of being judged by others. So I ask that we not judge this Pharisee too harshly. He is certainly more like us than we might care to admit. And in what way is he most like us? Well, if you might remember, and for those of you who weren't here last Sunday, he never actually made a decision. Um, and, and he never decided as to whether or not the message that Jesus was sharing with him was correct. And so Nicodemus was challenged in his knowledge of earthly desires and heavenly gifts, but did he actually take up that challenge? Does, does Nicodemus really understand what it means to be born again in the Holy Spirit? And just as our Sunday routine can attest in an overarching 2,000 years of Christian church history, we really haven't made many decisions either. Well, let me... Let me rephrase that. We have categorized ourselves, and we have sown a bit of strife in our history, and we maintain divisions where and when it is comfortable for us to rest on our salvation, forgetting the fruits of grace that we are gifted through faith in baptism. Like Nicodemus, we view one thing as abundant, time. Of all of the things that we have abundant in our church, Time is the most dangerous. So far as we know, Nicodemus may have been surprised or shocked that Jesus had been crucified, hoping that he would have had the opportunity to have met Jesus for a fourth time. Time was not on Nicodemus' side, and if we are to learn anything today other than God's deep, abiding, affirming love for all of creation, we don't have time either. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Our First Testament reading and psalm talk about a time, talk about time in two very different and very important ways. We are reminded that our religious ancestors were forced to wait out their obstinance and frustration with God for 40 years in the wilderness. Those that tested God and were unwilling to begin the holy habits of faith as God's care and love for God's people is shown in the miracles of food and water through Moses, they were unable to see the promised land. Their quarrel with God was worn out in death, and time in the wilderness was extended. Our psalm both exalts the steadfast faith of God and again reminds us to trust in God's covenant with Abraham that through Abraham we will receive that grace and mercy through our faith, through our love and trust of God. We love because God first loved us. If there is anything that I can tell you about seminary, it does not prepare those who are called by God to deal with difficult issues. We are presented with a great and many works from very wise people and told to wrestle with them in community which many of us do. Uh, so we're in classes about theology, the Book of Concord, which many of you may not even realize is a thing, but it's all of the confessions of the Lutheran Church wrapped up in a nice little 999-page document. <laughs> we learn about critical media literacy, mysticism, spiritual formation, the Gospels, the First and Second Testaments. We're given the keys to access answers to questions that many have wrestled before us for lifetimes. Some of us, through a variety of ministry opportunities, find these answers. But one thing is certain. We are given more information than is possible to share in a 20-minute sermon. Secrets, insider information, and things hidden from the general public are not in our curriculum. There are none. There really are no secrets, and I have access to the same information that you do. And so the only difference that I can divine between sitting out there and standing up here is God's call to me as a voice for the Holy Spirit. And make no mistake, there were lots of conversations with God in preparations for this sermon today. And I hope that you hear all of those prayers answered and that my love for you and for this church comes through as well. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. 
Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Martin Luther is a pretty central figure in our studies. I'm sure that you're shocked by that fact. You might also be shocked to know that he was a bit cynical, uh, and he started his Holy Spirit-driven re reformation based on a lot of personal frustration. You might say that he was frustrated at having to carry all of his guilt for his sins, day in and day out, and then he kind of became a little angry and resentful at the ideology behind the church's chosen message and, idea and uh, need and desire and the way that they decided to console conscience. His central question of how a loving God can make us feel so bad for consistently trying to access God's grace. Now, that, of course, is not a quote. It's a paraphrase, and it's for both of our sakes. Trust me. Luther was 34 when he began the Reformation effort in 1517 and 40 when he penned the Large Catechism. And in the Large Catechism, he says this, quote, For it is completely useless to try to change old people. We cannot perpetuate these things, these teachings, unless we train people who come up after us and succeed in our office and work so that they may, in turn, bring up their children successfully. In this way, God's word and Christian community will be preserved, end quote. And while I agree with Luther on many points, this is not one to which I can ascribe. I don't think that those of advanced age are incapable of change. And of course, when we look at the fact that Luther was 40 when he wrote this, I'm not entirely certain who he considered old at that time in the 16th century. So I think that when we look at the ingrained sin of division and categorization within our society and the fact that we were all brought up in it, trained to perpetuate it, and hurt others with our notions of that natural order of society, I think change becomes difficult for us all. And there is no age to define when that difficulty begins or where it ends. But God is bigger than all of this. God's love is further reaching. In Exodus this morning, we meet our sibling Hebrews arguing with God through Moses to show signs. We learn of the importance of faith, and that this lesson drives how important faith habits and practices are for our being able to find evidence of God all around us, not just in nature, but in creation, in humans especially. This arguing is not an indictment against the Jews, but a joining, proof that the Abrahamic faith traditions are cyclical and repetitious. We continue to ask God to prove God's self to us. We don't see the law handed down from Moses as enough. We experience it with a sense of dread. We don't exercise our liberation from sin enough. The saving grace we have through faith is often considered lazy grace, as we are inculcated, trained from birth to focus on tangible things, earthly things, focusing our attention not on God's good creation, but on things of our own making, on property and money. We ignore one another. The timeliness of this gospel with our current societal plight is not lost on me, and I'm sure that you too are concerned for those who are most vulnerable during this pandemic, the poor, the homeless, the immunocompromised, and the aged. There are other divisions and characterizations for whom we should also be concerned in this time of worry and anxiety. It will be too easy to turn inwardly during this time of social distancing and forget about those around us. We have seen the evidence of what human fear can do in these last few weeks. We have experienced the lies, the hoarding, the misinformation and the sensationalistic attitude perpetuating the mentality of us versus them. We have seen, we have a calling to tear down those barriers and to remember that everyone right now is on the same anxiety-driven playing field. For some of us, though, that anxiety-driven playing field is new. For others, those not present on this day or any Sunday, that's a way of life. Living in fear of those who have decided that the differences in how God made us are more important than the shared love of God, all being God's beloved children. And the message of the gospel being equal for every human on this planet 
It's as though we've decided that testing God in that love for our neighbor outside of our faith is a new and individual focus. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. We look at those who are considered the least by society and by those whom we have been given and perpetuated prejudice and blame them for their plight and for who they are not. We would choose to be pushed to the outer, who would choose to be pushed to the outer fringes of society out of fear or pressure? Who would deem that our words were not those of love and acceptance, affirmation and validation for their humanity? and the need we have for them to be in community with us. Jesus meets and talks to a Samaritan woman at a well. And for those who do not recognize the duality of significance within this statement, please let me explain. The Samaritans were a people who considered themselves of the Abrahamic faith, though they did not uphold the laws quite as strictly as the Jews did and may have tweaked a few of the Ten Commandments to meet their own tradition and religious needs. History would also tell us that when the Jews were being persecuted, the Samaritans were the first group to kind of step away. It was easier for them to turn away from God than it was to suffer the same persecution. So this Jewish state and religion then recognized that the Samaritan community was only worthy of trade, and nothing else. Anything that would even hint at a basic sense of friendship was strictly forbidden. No talking outside of business deals, no touching or exchanging anything other than goods and money. The Samaritans were unclean. And so then too, a woman's worth, only within the last 50 years, has become less and less tied to that of the man at her side. It's been a slow few thousand years for our sisters. And while it is easy to look at this general, generalization as not true for every woman, I promise that every woman has felt that struggle at one point or another. And so rather than look at these statements as a general characterization, I invite you to meditate on the reality of those not here on any given Sunday. This Samaritan woman represents the lowest of societal classes represented in the Second Testament. She is on the fringe and pushed there by a society that seeks to classify her based on divisions and characterizations outside of her control. Though truly, I tell you, she is a beloved child of God. So Jesus has just walked these eight miles to Sychar, and he has arrived at this well, potentially dug by the First Testament Jacob, and Jesus sits there to rest in the heat of the day, tired from the journey, and along comes this outcast. In a beautiful exchange of realities and truths, Jesus shares with her not only his knowledge of who she is, but also how she has lived her life. And while we experience this story, often at arm's length in a kind of historical context commentary kind of way, I imagine that this woman have probably had a fairly rapier wit to speak to a strange man alone in this way. She is likely quite proud, enjoys a good joke. She might be the type of person you'd enjoy being friends with, body, somewhat outspoken, the kind of person that you might exchange stories and experiences with. Her personality, and not likely her experience with the little respect for men that she has received, leads her to initially misunderstand Jesus' words of life. She continues to focus on the temporal, the earthly things. And then Jesus challenges her societal standing in an abrupt shift of what I imagine to be innocent and friendly banter to preaching, wherein this woman is now paying close attention. She, an outcast, the least, the labeled, seen as less than, unclean and undeserving, hears the word, the holy word, directly from Jesus' lips. She has been given a drink of the living water and has received validation, love, and inclusion, and has been then therefore reconciled unto God. Jesus' re disciples return and are astonished. 
These poor disciples stand in a constant state of astonishment, amazement, and disbelief more often than we care to admit. They hear and they see, yet they are always troubled and always unsure. This woman, however, the least of these in this story this morning, hears, believes, and then carries that good news to the people of her city. I send you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So this believing woman stands in our story today in place of all of those who are not here and who thirst. There are many Samaritan women in our society, and not all of them are women. She represents those on the fringe, pushed, pushed there by a society that has warped the natural order into a modern caste system, bent on dividing us by race, by culture, by history, by color, and by sexual orientation. Anytime our traditions or policies, our politics or doctrines are used to push someone away, it is this woman and the people who she represents that get hurt. This woman is every African American oppressed by a system of division and who needs our help, our support, our ability to see them as us, deserving and loved by God. This woman is every gay person, every lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer identifying person in our community that needs our help, our support, our ability to see them as us, deserving and loved by God. These two communities and countless others are pushed to the fringes of society and told they are not worthy. They are harassed and judged not by the content of their character, but by their associations, the color of their skin, their manner of dress. When, dear church, are we going to follow the example of Christ and go to where they are, meet them at the well, and affirm them, invite them into this community and share with them the love of God that we know and that they have, validating and affirming them, assuring them that they too are beloved children of God. Jesus sends us out to reap for that which we did not labor. Others have labored, and we have entered into their labor. Jesus calls us into the work that he began. His life-giving death has freed us to declare without fear of partisan politics, to love without fear, to see the Holy Spirit in every person, to say that black lives matter, and that all of creation includes lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, and the queer community. By grace, we have been saved. This time of anxiety and redefining what community looks like within our church for the medical health and safety of others, let us also seek God's abiding presence with us as we look to redefine what community looks like outside of this building. Remembering that health and safety for creation should not be only top of mind during a viral epidemic. Let's work also to slow hate, sharing God's love with those who have been harmed by our society, seeking to reconcile ourselves to God fully through the work that Jesus started and left for us to continue. Now is the time to shed the hesitations of Nicodemus and to deny that we share in the doubt of Jesus' teachings to his disciples. God is with us in our going out and our coming in. Let us be deliberate and bold in our sharing of love with all of creation. Now I invite you all to stand as we sing hymn 611, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say.
You may be seated as we invite the baptismal party to come forward. And I would invite the sponsors to come forward as well. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Who presents Landon Joseph Evans for holy baptism? Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with him among God's faithful people, bring him to the word of God and the Holy Supper, teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in his hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture him in faith and prayer, so that he may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help your child grow in the Christian faith and life? To the Godfather, do you promise to nurture this child in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help him live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? People of God, do you promise to support Landon Joseph and pray for him in his new life in Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebels against God and the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Will you please pour the water into the pond? We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters. Oh no, there's no water. Well, how silly is that? We'll, we'll have water momentarily. <laughs> Sorry. No, you weren't the one that was supposed to make sure there was water there. I was. So that's all right.
Thank you for running to get us some water. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the, in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Landon Joseph Evans is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He wants back in the water. <laughs> We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Landon Joseph with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, now and forever. Land and Joseph, child of God, you have been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Let your good works shine before others so that let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, which give glory to the Father in heaven. Amen. And let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Welcome into the family of God. Let's give this young man some applause. <laughs> On the front pew, you'll find not only the box for the candle, but there is a quilt. Here are here is his baptismal certificate and certificate for the sponsor. Um, you may return to your seats as we move to our seminary commissioning. Jason, I invite you to come and stand before the altar along our communion rail. To commission Jason Mills for his continued studies at United Lutheran Seminary. First, a reading from Mark. Jesus said, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you 
must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave to all. For the Son of Man came not to be, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And a reading from Acts. While the congregational leaders at Antioch were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Jason, in the presence of this assembly, will you accept this commission and commit yourself to your studies in the confidence that it comes from God? If so, say, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. Will you carry out ministries to which you are appointed in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and the confessions of the Lutheran Church? and in harmony with the constitutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I will, I ask God to help Will you endeavor in all things to conduct yourself as is fitting for an ambassador and servant of Jesus Christ? I will, I ask God to help me. Will you be faithful, understanding, and loving as you accompany the people among whom you will live and work? Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Amen. Now I'm going to Daniel. People of God, will you support this messenger of Jesus Christ, sent by God to serve all people, with the gospel of hope and salvation, will you pray for him, help and honor him for his work and study's sake, and in all things, strive to live in peace and unity in Christ? If so, say, we will and we ask God to help and guide us. We will, we will and we ask God to help and guide us. Let us pray. Gracious God, as you have called workers to vary tasks in the world and in your church, you have called Jason on this journey toward ordained ministry. Grant him joy and a spirit of bold trust that his work may stir up in each of us and in each of those whom he touches that it may stir up in them a life of faithful service through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, God bless and keep you, that you may be faithful in the studies, education, and service to which you have been commissioned. Amen. I think... This young man needs a round of applause as well. And I want to present to you a check that I'll quickly take back as we mail <laughs> to United Lutheran Seminary for sponsorship of your continued seminary education. Thank you for answering this call and serving God as you will. I need to buy
a deadly virus has afflicted thousands and is spreading across our lives despite Madison's best efforts to combat this virus. This, is, this infection has brought turmoil, panic, and unrest in all of our lives. Jesus taught us to bring all our concerns to him in prayer. If ever there was a time to turn to you, it is now, Lord, help us to see that the way to combat this virus, this panic and turmoil in our lives, is to turn to you in all things. You see our pain and anguish and will comfort us if we simply ask in the name of Christ. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Lord, many times you have tested your people and we have failed. Because we do not call on you, we create turmoil and chaos in our lives and the lives of many others. We know as Christians that the way to the cross is through Christ. You will answer all our prayers with grace and mercy, which will quiet our troubled hearts and ease our present turmoil and suffering. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful Father, there are many in our church community who are vulnerable to this spreading virus. Lay your powerful and protective hand on those so afflicted with this virus, and especially care for those in our midst. We pray for Mary Ann Allen, Mary Ann. Virginia Bauman. Virginia. Mary Brentke. Mary. Crystal Collin. Crystal. Ernie Hassel. Ernie. Rhoda Hunter. Rhoda. Kurt Kohlmeyer. Kurt. Marilyn Kostrowski. Marilyn. Susan Mahoney. Susan. Michael Mahoney. Michael. Linda McClellan. Linda. Nancy Meisner. Nancy. Yvonne Nelson. Yvonne. Barry Palmer. Barry. Chris Ransom. Chris. Bob Robbins. Bob. Carol Rausch. Carol. Audrey Skidmore. Audrey. Don Spensley. Don. Ken Teeter. Ken. Peggy Teeter. Peggy. Cheryl Van Patten. Cheryl. And Ron Westcott. Lord, please also lift up in special prayer in your protective way the most vulnerable amongst us in our community, those in the hospital suffering from long-term chronic illnesses, those in treatment for cancer, and those in long-term medical care facilities, especially Janine Grinnell Janine. and Shelby Waters. Shelby. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Father, the ELCA, like church bodies elsewhere, has taken steps to protect the public and its members by curtailing church services like these today. Please watch over the church leaders as they struggle with these important decisions, which may affect many Christians who cherish weekly attendance at church and their faithful and spiritual walk. Please watch over our bishops, Elizabeth Eaton and Craig Satterley, and pastors Matt and John here at Bethlehem as they continue to minister to this congregation. Please watch over Jason Mills as he struggles, as he continues to study at Gettysburg Theological Seminary, preparing his way for a life in the service of your word. We also thank Jason for his words of wisdom and his message today. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Father, please care for our mission partners in the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and the Baker Street neighborhood here in Lansing. We also lift up in special prayers today the Trinity Lutheran Church in Millersburg, Michigan. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Heavenly Father, our worldwide crisis often depends on brave and heroic soldiers and military personnel to protect us from harm. These people thanklessly serve to protect us from greater harm in times of tragedy, panic, and turmoil. We lift them up in special prayers today, especially Chris Brown, yes. Darian Doan, yes. Carson Kozlowski, Carson. Joshua Kozlowski, yes. Joshua. Rusty Landry, yes. Rusty. Christopher Morgan, Christopher. Ben Painter, ben. Ryan Schiffner, Ryan. Jake Sonneberg Jake. and Eric Wheeler. Hear us, 
O God. Your mercy is great. Father, please watch over all our governmental leaders in this in the coming weeks as they struggle with important decisions to address the spread of this daily virus, deadly virus. We keep all our leaders in our special prayers and ask that you bestow on them guidance and wisdom from heaven above. Hear us, O oh God. We give you thanks for the life of faith you have given to all of us, and especially to the newly baptized Landon Joseph. And we ask that you be with him and his parents, Samantha and Joseph, as they grow in faith toward you and in fervent love for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. Good and gracious God, we commend to you all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Amen. Please rise. No.
Christ, and the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism, that we may provide for those who are poor. Pray for those in need. Fast from self-indulgence. And above all, that we may find treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing, Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer, hymn 618, we'll sing verses 1 and 3. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. 